is Dr. Will Sedley, who's going to give the presentation today. So we welcome Will. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Got it. <laughs> Just prior to that, yeah, Kevin is doing speech to text in the corner. Um, and you see Billy and Jim at the back. They're filming the event today. If you don't want to be in the finished product of the film, just let us know or let the guys know that and it won't appear anywhere. And it won't appear anywhere without anybody's, uh, without us seeing it and consent first. Yep, we all okay with that? Yeah, and I'll now hand you to Will. Yeah, you had your yeah, calls yeah. before, is it? I, I have, yeah, no, I don't, I don't, need, I don't need more. <laughs> so, uh, ah, like that. I thought I don't have enough things on my belt. I should, uh, I should add some more. I had my watch on there this morning. It fell off while I was walking down the corridor. That's right. Well, thank you for thank you for having me here. It's it's my pleasure, really. I'm uh, I'm hoping that um, you'll come away having learned something about tinnitus. I can't explain everything to you. Um, I've I'll come on come on to my uh, my background and training and everything in detail, but I've spent three hours recently trying to ex explain my new theories of tinnitus to a, to a world expert, and it took the full three hours to just about, just about get us to see eye to eye and check we were talking about the same thing. So I'm not going to be able to explain everything, but I'm hoping I can educate you a bit, and more so, I'd like to be educated, because as our thinking and understanding of tinnitus is moving on, um, I'm thinking all the time about how, how we might, as, as doctors, as health professionals, best... Uh, organize our tinnitus services to meet the needs of yourselves and after all you and other people with tinnitus are who it's all about not us so I'll t uh, before I launch into the talk I suppose I'll tell you a bit about my background so I'm, I, I'm I'm a doctor I graduated from medical school in 2007 and I I've come in I will hold my hands up and say I've come into working with tinnitus by complete accident um, I was always fascinated by the brain and how the brain creates our sense of reality and what we experience and thought I should probably do something that captures that down the line. Um, I was lucky enough to get a post that funded me um, to start conducting research uh, straight out of medical school in the, with research on the brain and nervous system and I uh, crossed paths with a very able chap called Tim Griffiths over at Newcastle University and we, we've been conducting re research together since. Um, and he, he works in the auditory system. And I thought, well, the auditory system, that's part of the brain. I'd like to study that. Why not give it a go? And quite quickly, I came across tinnitus, and my first reaction was, why would anybody want to study that? It sounds really boring. <laughs> um, and the first, you know, the first thing to say, and it's not the most important thing about it, is that um, when you get into it, it's, it's fascinating. We, you know, we are... Anyone who experiences this, um, I myself get a bit, is being tricked. We're all being fooled by our brains into experiencing as, you know, as clear as daylight, as real as anything else, that there is, a, you know, a sound, a thing that's there that is not in the outside environment. You know, this, this is happening. No one else can see it, so I can see why people might not be excited about it. But this is, you know, this is real, and this is happening to one in seven people or more. And that's perhaps the most important thing. This, this is huge. This is more common than, you know, asthma, diabetes, epilepsy, um, you know, as on, on, the, you know, on the scale of prevalence up with cancer, heart disease and things. This should, this should, you know, and this is affecting people of all ages, doesn't have a solution. And once you start to get into that, you think, why, why is... Why is more not not being done? Why why are and I'm sure you're all you know wondering this yourself. Why why isn't this a bigger priority? Why you know why isn't why isn't there more talk about this? This is just being allowed to happen now. Thankfully, actually, I've, I've, as I've learned, there is a tremendous amount of research going on into tinnitus worldwide. It's a very active research community. There's a lot of big figures, prominent you know, fantastic people working on it. Well, you know, in the UK and worldwide, but we're still not there. And still, you know, being in the clinic, in the doctor's surgeries, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know it was all going on because we've, st we've still not cracked it and we're not, we're not there. Um, so I, I've worked on, on tinnitus on, on and off for seven, over, over seven years now. 
Um, I've, I've just I've been lucky enough to get funding from the Medical Research Council to uh, undertake three years full-time research into tinnitus, which I've just finished, um, including in part thanks to thanks to some members of this group. I shan't name any names. Uh, confidentiality in that. Um, and this this is my third time being here. I came as a junior researcher who knew nothing about tinnitus and wanted to meet people and get volunteered. And I'm hoping as time's gone on, I'll be able to give a little bit more back, and it be a less one-way street of me coming for my own knowledge. We'll see. I don't want to promise, promise too much. Anyway, so I'll, I'll, launch, I'll launch into, I don't know what the computer's now, uh, now doing, but uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to talk to you about anyway. This is, this is a whistle-stop tour, and then a number of questions I'd, I'd like your opinion on. So I'm going to define tinnitus, give a little bit of background. You, you're not going to need to know this, this stuff. And I'm going to focus a little bit less on what, what we know from tinnitus research and what tinnitus research can explain. And I'm actually going to focus a bit on what, what it still can't explain. Um, I'm then going to talk about some of my own research um, and, and that of some of my colleagues uh, that we've performed locally and in collaboration with some other research groups. I'll talk a bit about treatments, not too much, because as you'll know, generally there are not good, widely effective treatments, but I'll list some of these and why, why they don't work, and then lay out what in my mind are some of the perhaps potentially, potentially fruitful avenues for research in future for how we might start to really uh, make more progress in tackling tinnitus. Um, and then I'll uh, finish, finish with some questions for you, and that's the bit where I'm hoping to, hoping to continue to learn myself. So I don't need to define tinnitus for you. It's you hear sound, where there is not sound in the environment. It's generally persistent, and it's usually a simple sound. Some people get music, and very rarely even voices, although that's unusual in this context, maybe musical lyrics. But we're talking about some, you know, basic tinnitus, whether it's a ringing, a whistling, a hissing, a banging, a buzzing, these, these sorts of things. And that are generally an isolated phenomenon. It can occur due to part of a wider, wider neurological disorder, but it's generally something that occurs in in and of its own right, in, in isolation. As I mentioned before, so the, the best evidence about the prevalence of this we have, it's from US studies, but I th we think the UK is about the same. About one in seven people will seek medical attention in their, in their lifetime for ongoing troublesome, you know, tinnitus enough to bother them. And 2% of the whole pop adult population um, claims to have a significantly impaired quality of life long term on account of ongoing tinnitus. So this is this is massive. And you don't need me to tell you it's massive, but it's it's massive and it's very, very common. Um, it becomes more common with increasing age, but it can start any time from childhood and it's not a not a rarity any anywhere from there onwards. Um, and the big the big risk factor is hearing loss. Um, I'll come a bit uh, come on to that a little bit more just now, in fact, uh, in a minute, actually. So what, my, this is my impression of what happens when somebody gets tinnitus and goes to the doctor. So if you start at the top here, you, you go, oh, I've got this noise in my ear. This isn't very nice. Um, you go to the doctor th and think, well, I can hear so much that's going on. The doctor's bound to be able to see or hear something, because why am I hearing all this? The doctor looks in your ear and goes, well, I can't see anything, You're Ill. or they'll say you've got wax or something like that. But we'll basically say, hmm, not sure, let's do a hearing test. Maybe let's do an MRI scan. Anyone here had an MRI scan? Yeah, yeah. And whether or not there's anything on either of those, I mean, this person here, this example person has some high frequency hearing loss, which most people with tinnitus have, some people won't. And regardless of the result of that, and regardless of the result of the MRI scan, you come back to the doctor who goes, hmm, don't know. And you go one of these two ways. You are either like the either like this more uh, stoical woman at the bottom here who goes, oh well, if there's nothing else wrong, I can live with this, all right. Or you go, well, that's that's no good. This is awful. I can't live with this, and you get driven totally mad. And and that you know this this is and this has it anyone had an anyone had an experience with doctors that doesn't fall into this category? Oh yeah. About 25 years ago or so, when I experienced a tinnitus in my GP at the time, and um, diagnosed a tinnitus, he didn't look at my ears, but right. this was a different generation. 
Okay. So you got the you got the shrug without even the initial test of that. Okay. So you had an even more limited journey than, uh, than this. Can any, anyone can anyone relate to parts of this uh, parts of this? Yeah. Okay. I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot of nodding. Uh, I'll, I'll come back I'll come back to this at the end. We'll go we'll go on with the body of the talk. Um, so a lot of uh, one of the, you know one of the big questions. Um, in early tinnitus research, but it's, it's actually still not a solved question, although it's often treated as solved. Where is the tinnitus? Is it coming from the ear, or is it coming from the brain? So we started out thinking, well, the sound's in the ear, surely it's coming, you know, it, it occurs mainly if the ear is damaged, surely it's coming from the ear, surely the, the ear's angry and damaged, and the little hair cells are sending off nerve impulses, and we're hearing them, right? But, and so on this sort of right-hand edge of the scales, there's some factors in favor of tinnitus being generated in the ear. If you have a major source, you know, noise-induced hearing loss from a sudden noise trauma, or even if you just go to a really now loud nightclub concert or anything and get ringing in your ears afterwards, even temporarily, the tinnitus often starts straight away. So you might think, well, the brain hasn't had time to catch up and cause anything. So that suggests maybe it's from the ear. And in, in the gung-ho glory days of surgery, they used to go around cutting people's ner auditory nerve from the ear to try and treat tinnitus, and it did sometimes work. Um, you'll notice, I'll come back to this procedure, as you can see, on the, it features on the other side as well. And actually, more, more recently, they've shown that in animal models, where you, you use noise trauma to cause what we think is tinnitus, the activity higher up in the brain that you record is correlated to the activity in the ear. They fire and peak at the same time. So there does seem to be a connection between them. And there's a, anyone here take fruzamide? There's a water tablet, common water tablet, but I learned recently it acts on the ear as well. It doesn't act on the brain at all, but it acts on the ear and suppresses activity in the cochlea a little bit. And they've found that giving this drug to animals with tinnitus, um, acute tinnitus they've just caused, seems to help. And they tried it in people, and it maybe helps a bit, but it just doesn't, while you're giving it, no real lasting benefit. These are big injected doses. So, again, you can do something to tinnitus just by working on the ear. But we also know factors in favor of it having a brain origin on this sort of left side of the scales. What people who have hearing loss and tinnitus have reduced firing in the auditory nerve. So the brain is getting, at, overall, is getting less input from the ear. But when you measure activity in the hearing pathways in the brain, it's elevated. So somehow the brain is going from reduced input to increased activity higher up. We think it's turning up the volume dial, turning up the gain somewhere in the pathway. Um, and some people think, you know, quite rightly so, this, this increased gain or amplification might have something to do with, with tinnitus there. And also cutting the auditory nerve can cause tinnitus and it can exacerbate tinnitus. So sometimes it helps, sometimes it makes it worse. So it's quite clear that whatever the link with the ear is, the brain is quite capable of generating tinnitus by itself. So it seems. Watch this space for, for further debate anyway. But there's, as well as this ongoing debate, there's, there, are some things, there are some things that still don't add up despite all the international research effort in tinnitus. So one, these are some, you know, these are some of the selected oddities. It's not all of them that we haven't explained. But one of these is tinnitus is normal. The majority of people have tinnitus. I'll try and convince you of this. Um, not to the same extent, but, but do. So this, I've got a picture of a soundproof booth here. 60% of utterly well, healthy, normal hearing adults, if you put them in a soundproof booth and tell them to concentrate... 60% of them quite quickly will say, oh yeah, actually, I hear, and they'll describe a sound that is just like the tinnitus that you or I would experience. It's much quieter, it doesn't, it can't get itself above background noise, but it's there, and it's the same thing, and when you quantify it, when you measure the pitch, it's the same thing that we experience, but it's, it's much, much less. So every, or the majority of people have a bit of tinnitus. And even those who don't, if you get them to do forced contractions and movements of their head, neck, and jaw, the majority of them can cause tinnitus while doing these maneuvers. In fact, I didn't used to have tinnitus. I was so interested by this, I practiced with all kinds of maneuvers. Lots, I used to have a lot of train journeys, and I'd sit there trying this and that, and uh, 
I, was, I, I caused tinnitus. It didn't go away. It's not that bad, but uh, it's not gone. <laughs> so tinnitus is, is the norm. Now, you might say, well, no, maybe everybody's got damaged hearing, but, you know, it's, it's, it's more unusual not to have a bit of tinnitus. So that's one thing. We're trying to explain something that is a normal phenomenon but is grossly exaggerated in some people. Now, we all, we all know hearing loss is a big risk and the major risk factor for tinnitus, but even when tinnitus is caused by hearing loss, it doesn't have to start at the same time. It can start as soon as some, the thing that causes the hearing loss. It can start, you can have the hearing loss, which has gone on and on and on and on, no problem for months, years, and one day, bang, the tinnitus starts. Why is that? What's, what's this second process? Why, why, you know, how can this have been there the whole time but you only get the tinnitus there much later? And, we, you know, anecdotally, this can begin out of the blue or during a time of physiological or psychological stress, sort of high alert modes and things. Are we, are we, on the, are we in threat detection mode? Are we picking up on things that slip under the radar because we're hyperstimulated? There's, there's theories on this. But it's not a straightforward relationship anyway. And also, hearing loss can occur without tinnitus. Man many people have hearing loss and never get tinnitus. So why do, they not, why do they not get it? And some people do. And then why do some people, without hearing loss, get tinnitus? So it's not a consistent relationship in any, in any respect. Now, coming into it, I don't want to go into too much of the fine detail of brain recordings, but there, I'll tell you, there's been a lot of interest of measuring ongoing brain waves. This is with electrodes on your scalp or magnetic sensors around the brain, picking up on what the, the auditory part of your brain is doing just at rest. And there, about, from about 2005 onwards, there was a lot of interest in this because the research groups were, they were taking a group of people with tinnitus and comparing them to, well, okay, they were taking middle-aged people with hearing loss and tinnitus and measuring their brain activity, and they were taking university students with no hearing loss and no tinnitus and getting them to sit at rest in this scanner and comparing their brain activity. And lo and behold, there were lots of differences in the hearing parts of the brain. There were these abnormal patterns of activity, and lots of theories have been built on this, careers have been made on this. But when people have gone back and done the same study but not used young normal hearing university students and used people of the same age and the same hearing level as the people with tinnitus, there are no differences. So hearing loss and a predisposition towards tinnitus has, has correlates in terms of brain activity. It changes your ongoing brain activity, but the brain activity doesn't seem to care who actually goes on to get tinnitus. So we may be measuring a precursor but then there's something, there's something a bit less defined, this second hit, you know, the, the bit that why you suddenly wake up with tinnitus one day when you never had it before, even though you've had your t hearing loss for 10 years. We're not getting at that in terms of brain imaging. But if you suppress tinnitus temporarily, or if then you cause reliable changes in brain activity, there are reliable brain correlates of how loud the tinnitus is, and if you successfully treat it, a bit controversial, the treatment in question here, then again, you get brain activity changes. So there are brain correlates of the severity of tinnitus, but not of not that actually distinguish people from, with tinnitus to those who are just predisposed with it. So we're still missing a trick. So in terms of the research I've, I've been doing, so I've, I've been working full time on tinnitus research the last three years, but I've, I've done periods of tinnitus research off and on over the several years before that. And, I've been very fortunate in terms of getting research funders interested, so I've uh, been supported a lot by the National Institute of Health Research and the Medical Research Council, who've um, funded me for the last three years and all the, all the research I've been doing. And, and the things I'd like to talk to you about are on brain activity and, and brain chemistry as well, which is a more emerging area um, in tinnitus. And, you know, once again, I've always received very great support from uh, members of members of this group. I'm not. I'm not touting for business here. Unfortunately, there's no there's no project just now on the horizon. I do plan to continue this research down the line. But uh, you know, another another note of thanks to to everybody who's you know even those who volunteered and not been suitable. It's uh, all all very appreciated. So just to, just to bring you through a couple of these studies. This is this is one that's just been accepted for publication actually in a very in the Journal of Neuroscience, which is a very well respected. Uh, venue for it to appear. 
and I looked, looked at 14 people with, with chronic tinnitus and 14 people who are really well matched for age, hearing, sex, um, everything else. Um, and I split the groups, half normal hearing, no, normal-ish hearing, half with significant hearing loss. And again, the control healthy, vol well, with volunteers without tinnitus were, were matched in every respect but the tinnitus. And these are just, I don't know if anyone's familiar with looking at audiograms here, but the left to right is the different frequencies from low to high. We've got left ear and right ear, and the worse the hearing is. So we're seeing a drop off, a worsening hearing into the higher frequencies. And the, the, da the solid line is the control group, the dashed line is the tinnitus group, and you can see, I was very proud of this, that matches that good just never, never happen really, so, so I got very lucky there. But they're a very nicely matched group, and there's a table, I won't take you through everything, just showing that all the other measures we got matched as well. Everyone's gone through an MRI scanner to have, uh, using special techniques to look at the brain chemistry in the auditory cortex, the higher, higher hearing center of the brain. Um, so an example here, this is, this is one individual's brain image. And this square is, this is the area we got the, the measured the chemical signals from. It's quite a large area, but it covers the whole, the whole auditory cortex. And what we get out is this nice chemical spectrum. If anyone's in, heard, uh, familiar with mass spectrometry or other kinds of spectrometry, we get these nice chemical peaks. And there's a blown up one of here. This is what we're interested in. This is, this is GABA. If anyone's come across GABA, it's the main, it's the main inhibitory chemical in the brain. Um, that dampens down excessive activity. Lots and lots of well-known medications work on GABA, the, the benzodiazepines, many epilepsy drugs, um, some, some others as well. And there's reason to think that there might, be, there might be deficiencies in GABA localized to the auditory parts of the brain in tinnitus. So an inability to inhibit what should normally be inhibited, perhaps to the point where it doesn't get perceived. So that's the, that's the thought. And what, what we've found, um, we'll particularly look at the right, we've got a better signal from the right side of the brain for technical reasons, but the control group has this amount of GABA, and the tinnitus group had significantly less, which cannot be accounted for by hearing, age, any of these other factors. It seems like there is a primary deficiency of chemical inhibition related to tinnitus. So this, this, the, the full implications of what this means are yet to be established, that it's a need for further work. But this is, this is really the first time that this has been conclusively demonstrated. Um, to tell you a bit about another study, this, this one I actually did down in London um, using an MEG scanner. If anyone's ever had an EEG where you stick all the little electrodes on your scalp, this is... If anyone's a physics, anyone, if anyone's a physics nerd, you'll know that any source of an electrical field is also a source of a magnetic, of an electrical potential is also a source of a magnetic field at right angles. And so, instead of putting electric sensors on the brain, you can use magnetic ones. And there's a few technical advantages I won't won't bore you with, but we have a scanner that down there we we can get access to. So I've dragged 16 people with tinnitus and another another well matched group of of controls matched for age, sex, and hearing loss, and done resting. So. As I mentioned before, this kind of research has been done, but not, not generally with well-matched groups, only once. So this is the second only study using well-matched groups. And I've looked at a few things that the first study, study didn't. and focused on activity in the auditory cortex and the hearing parts of the brain and compared these groups. This is an MEG scanner, so there's, some, there's a nice array of magnetic sensors buried deep in here, just, on, just over the surface of the brain. The whole rest of this is a massive tank of liquid helium because these are superconductors and they only work when they're about at absolute zero. So it's perfectly safe as long as nobody punctures the tank. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm just I'm kidding. I mean, it's, it's well armored. There have never been any MEG accidents. It's a very safe, quiet machine. This is not one of my volunteers, but this is the same scanner. This is exactly what they'd have looked like. And I made them sit there and look at a white cross on a black screen. It was very boring. Um, but what did we find? There were no differences um, between the tinnitus group and the control group. As, as before, I worked very hard on using the most sensitive techniques to, to find any subtle differences there might be. So again, we're not differentiating between those with tinnitus and those simply with the predisposition, with the, hear with the hearing loss and all the changes that go with the hearing loss all the compensatory process, extra amplification in the brain. But what we did find 
And again, these are some, these yellow boxes are just my areas of interest in these hearing related or tinnitus related parts of the brain. There were, there were correlates of factors related to tinnitus. Perhaps most interestingly, the degree of hearing loss, particularly within the tinnitus group, but in both, did correlate very strongly with, with ongoing activity. So again, it's the predisposition, not the tinnitus, that's causing these brain changes. But the, the, the loudness, this, the perceived loudness of the tinnitus did also correlate with the type of brain activity and also the current loudness on a day-to-day -day basis in a slightly different part of the brain. This is a more high-level area, so it may be that there are correlates in the hearing part of the brain about how loud your tinnitus is, and then in these higher centers, the signal gets fed through on the days, more so on the days where the tinnitus is, is bad. Again, this, this, needs, this needs more work, but it, it echoes what we were suspecting before, that we've, we've been missing a trick. We're not getting at the, what is the brain correlate of tinnitus, as opposed to just all the surrounding, confounding, predisposing factors. And what, one, one last study I'll tell you about before I'm trying to bring any of some of this together. Um, the, the people up here who I did the brain MRI scans on to get the chemical measurements, they also had an EEG study while I made them watch The Lion King without the sound on and played lots of very loud, repetitive, annoying sounds to them to see how the brains responded to the sounds. Um, kudos to anyone who went through this. By the end of the day, you know, it's the last thing you feel like doing. Most people tolerated it well. One person couldn't hack the sound. Not, not, it wasn't anyone from here. It was one of the control volunteers, in fact. Um, so we me measured their brain activity while using some special sounds, and I used ones in the tinnitus range and ones below the tinnitus range. And what, what, I'd, what I'd found, these are, so again, the, the greys are the control group, the white are the tinnitus group, and the height of the bar is just the strength of the brain response here. The, the, t the, the sounds at one kilohertz below the tinnitus frequency, that's really below everyone's tinnitus range, were exactly the same between the groups. But at four kilohertz, which fell within everyone's tinnitus range, the tinnitus group has significantly greater amplification of these. And this was after accounting for the hearing loss and even after accounting for hyperacusis. So there, is, there are things going on. There is abnormal brain chemistry. There is excessive sound amplification. But there isn't, a, there isn't a tinnitus signature, it seems, in the ongoing brain activity. There's something we're still failing to, failing to spot here. So what, you know, what I've been helping to demonstrate is tinnitus isn't associated with changes in ongoing brain activity over and above a predisposition to tinnitus. But it, does, it is associated with deficient chemical messengers that normally inhibit brain activity. And it is associated with increased amplification of, of sounds and sound signals coming up from the ear. So I'll, t I'll talk a bit about treatments and then maybe even a bit about why they don't work. So if anyone's heard of this, the, the Cochrane Library is one of our sort of hallowed institutions of research evidence. So whenever there's been randomized, double-blind, controlled trials of treatments, the Cochrane Library come along and invite people to review these in a systematic manner and bring, a bit, bring together in a formal way all the evidence that exists on a subject and then publish a report about what works, what doesn't, what might work. And what they've found, there have been a lot of... There's, I, don't know, I don't know why they, how they managed to have enough evidence to review a number of studies on ginkgo biloba for tinnitus. Anyone taken ginkgo biloba? So they, they concluded that there, were, there wasn't evidence to support... I mean, I, I would never encourage... If anyone perceives a benefit, takes it and perceives a benefit, I'd always say carry on. But they concluded that ginkgo biloba and various drugs, antidepressants, benzodiazepines, and uh, anti-epileptics, there's no evidence to support their use. They, no one's convincingly done better with their tinnitus than those given placebo. Intermediate, and I, you know, here I may well be challenged on this, because these are in really widespread use, but hearing aids and masking devices are used a lot for people with tinnitus who have significant hearing loss who experience a benefit from them. The, the conclusion was there isn't the evidence to support their use, but there's just not very much evidence at all. And what does work um, are psychological therapies, not to make the tinnitus quieter, but to allow people to habituate and react more positively or neutrally to their tinnitus. So 
the one with the best evidence is cognitive behavioral therapy. There's also tinnitus retraining therapy. So those, those definitely work. There's very good evidence for it. And then there's all other you know, approaches to doing the same thing that just haven't had the formal evidence. So we're at a state where people, going back to that earlier pathway and you know, the, two, the two example patients, one who was very bothered, one who wasn't, treatment really aims to get people from that bothered category more towards the less bothered category. And I, I suspect a lot, you know, a lot of what goes on here is very much with this, this aim in mind. But we're missing a trick for actually making the tinnitus get quieter or go away. That's the, that's the million dollar question still. And a, a lot of other treatments have been tried. People have injected Botox around the ears and into the scalp. Um, people, and this is just alphabetical order, they've used brain implants that electrically stimulate different bits of the, either the auditory cortex or the deep structures in the brain. There are acoustic treatments using little iPod-like devices that play customized sounds to try and, to try and suppress the tinnitus. There's EEG neurofeedback where you learn to control your brain waves, these ones that we correlate with the severity of the tinnitus. There's transcranial ultrasound. I'm not even sure how that's meant to work, but that's, there's research going into that. There's fruizamide, or this, I was saying, acts on the ear. Notched music therapy, listen to your favorite music three hours a day or however long with the tinnitus frequencies taken out. The evidence a bit, a bit iffy. Some people seem to get benefit from it. Not really cracking the tinnitus and making it go away. But And then there's this TDCS, that's putting an electrical current through the brain. There's uh, RTMS, repetitive magnetic stimulation, firing sequences of magnetic pulses there. And all, you know, these variably do a bit, but they're not really nailing it in the long term. And then there's this vagus nerve stimulators. People are, the vagus nerve is the, it's, it's a big player in the autonomic system. It's what makes your body relax. So they stimulate it and induce relaxation while playing you tones matched to your tinnitus, and that's meant to undo the tinnitus networks. Uh, the trials are ongoing in humans. It worked, it worked in rats. But uh, as I'll come on to, what works in rats and guinea pigs and mice doesn't always work in, in people. People, uh, well, there's a number of differences. Which brings me on to why, and you know, it's not, there's been a great number of treatments that look really promising in the animal studies. But then when you get them into people, they either don't work as well or don't work. And, and why? Why is, why is this? So the two, two sort of popular arguments for why, why this might be the case. One, one would be to say that um, what we're measuring in the animals is not really tinnitus. So, and the, the question everyone always asks me is, well, how do you tell if an animal has tinnitus at all? And that there's, two, there's two broad ways of doing this. Um, one is you train the animal to do a certain behavior or not do it when it hears a tone that resembles tinnitus, a high-pitched ongoing, ongoing tone or sound like that. And then you do something to its ear, you damage it or something, and then if the animal starts doing that behavior that it learned to do when the sound was there, then you think, hey, it's got tinnitus. That seems quite reliable. It's very laborious. It takes months and months and months. And then there's these high-throughput methods where if you play anyone a really, if, if any, anyone is suddenly exposed to a very loud sound, we'll jump and startle. And animals, rodents have this great startle reflex. But you can make something less startling by playing a smaller sound before it. And in fact, you can make the startling thing less startling if you have an ongoing tone. Beep. If you just put a little gap in that tone, just before the big sound that elicits the startle, you've had that warning and you're not as startled. So... Um, the, the little gap before suppresses the startle response, but what they'd found is animals thought to have tinnitus with the right conditions to get it. If you put this little gap in the noise, in the tone, before there, they weren't any less startled. It was like they couldn't hear the gap. So there's a lot of excitement about this because you don't need to train the animals. You can, do, you can use this model in dozens of animals really quickly and loads of research groups have started using it. Unfortunately, it's heavily confounded and it's turned... They've, they've actually done the same things in people, and it turns out the tinnitus doesn't fill in the gap at all. Um, there are just difficulties in gap perception due to the hearing damage and, and exaggerations or changes in the startle response. So it's all, it's been, it's been a bit of a disappointment that. So one of the reasons is that we're not, maybe weren't really measuring tinnitus when we thought we were. Another one is that animals tend, they tend to cause tinnitus in an animal, demonstrate the presence of tinnitus, go, yeah, it's there, give the treatment, and then measure them straight after the treatment and then assess them a week, 
three weeks down the line. And that, that's great, but um, pe most people with tinnitus don't seek medical attention or, you know, don't enter a, enter a drug trial or a trial of any treatment when they've had tinnitus for a week. They, they enter when they've had tinnitus for six months, two years, five years, ten years. So it don't, it's not reasonable to assume that the brain and the pathways in the, from the brain of someone who's just developed tinnitus are anywhere like the same as someone who's had it for years. Things, things change over time and become up, can become much more stubborn, and there's, there's research on this. So what, to bring some things together, I don't want to get too bogged down in detail, but what I think is happening in tinnitus, I, I think that a lot of people have a predisposition to tinnitus if you have hearing loss your brain will turn up the gain to compensate for it. And there's always noise in the system. There's always cells that randomly fire. That's just, that's just life. And that noise gets amplified. That gets fed through. But so that, it's a tinnitus precursor. Anyone with hearing loss, I would argue, has this. Certain people with a given chemical makeup in their brain, lots of people will have this. But usually, or in that state, the brain tunes it out. Our brains are very, very good at tuning out things that are irrelevant. We get a lovely, clean, targeted view of the world. We just perceive the things that are relevant. And all lots and lots of signals just never make it into our radar. The brain has ways. It just says, oh, this signal's too low quality, or it's, it doesn't mean anything. And if you think about this noisy, poor quality, spontaneous signal from the ear that's ongoing, it never changes. It doesn't relate to anything in the environment. It's only natural our brain would, would attempt to tune this out. But for whatever reason, at some point, some temporary factors conspire to get the brain to pay attention to this. And the signal comes onto our conscious threshold. And I would say at that point, well, there might be a window to intervene and get it back below the radar, and it goes away again. But if it's there for long enough, then we learn to expect it. We give it a name, we pay attention to it, we may worry about it. And as soon once all that's happened, quite quickly, it's not just a meaningless, irrelevant thing. It's a real thing. And once, and you know, this can happen totally outside of our voluntary control. Even our subconscious centers are picking up and saying, no, this is a, you know, this is a real thing. And once it's there firmly as a real thing, even if all these temporary factors subside and the signal driving it becomes much less strong, our brain is tuned to pick up on it. Can you, you know, how, how do you, how do you learn to forget or unremember something that has become a real thing? I'd like to give a little example of this. As I, I hope too many of you haven't seen this picture before, but uh, anyone, anyone like to tell me what's, what's, in, this, is, what's in this picture? Is this, is this more than just a random pattern of dots? Any, any volunteers? A recumbent elephant. I've <laughs> seen it before. I've seen a dog. Uh, it's a dog. It's a dog in it. Oh. Yeah, it is. It is a dog. Can anyone see the dog? Has it got yeah. a fish? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah, the dog is here, and you get the impression that might be the shade underneath a tree and the trunk of a tree and a path coming down here. Now, can, anyone, can everyone see the dog now? Yeah. yeah. So the dog's, the dog's head is here. Mm -hmm. You can see its ear there. It's got a leg here, a leg here. Mm -hmm. There's its body. And it's a Dalmatian dog, so it blends in with the speckles. <laughs> if you can't see it, take my word for it. But for, for anyone who can... Can you unsee the dog now? If I come back off this slide. If we come back, can you see anything other than the dog straight away? We all, all convinced, there's a lot of silence. I'm, I'm assuming that's because everyone's convinced. Mm -hmm. um, this, this is a very well, well established thing. So once, once you've seen it, you can't, no matter how hard you try, you will, and it, you could look at this picture in 10 years time, you'll see the dog. You, you will see the dog straight away. And this, this, I think this is what I would argue the trouble with tinnitus is. I, I would say this pattern of black and white dots, you know, at a glance, you'd almost dismiss as, as noise, you know. And if your eyes just glanced over it, it was just there in the background, you saw it, you might, you'd probably, ne you know, never necessarily give it a second look. But once you picked up on it, it becomes a real thing. It's a vivid thing, and it's something that we cannot help but look out for again. And, you know, and this is down to the subconscious, involuntary parts of our mind. Once it's there, we expect it. You can't un undo that. And I think a similar thing is happening in tinnitus here. Once that sound is there, that 
well, not sound, the spontaneous activity, the precursor of sound is, all, is there in everyone with a predisposition. But once we latch upon to it, once, once it's become a real thing, you, can't, you don't go back. Well, or not naturally, generally. Can the, you know, does this tell us, you know, does this, does this inform us, does the, you know, do these, do these theories, if, if true, help us? And I can think of two ways this might help us. The, f the first is, can we, can we identify, can we get rid of tinnitus before it crosses that point of no return where the memory is lodged and it won't go away again? It might only have a few weeks from when it starts, if, if that. Or can we find a way to undo that memory, that, that notion of the tinnitus as a real thing that keeps this, you know, that perpetuates the vicious cycle that makes us keep on picking up on it, where once upon a time it would have slipped under the radar and never gone noticed. On that note, I was lucky enough to study a neurosurgical patient. This is their brain. Um, this is the left-hand side of their brain. And all these, th this person had epilepsy that was nothing to do with their tinnitus, but they had tinnitus from, from noise damage from firing guns. And they, they spent two weeks with all these, every black dot is an electrode on the surface of their brain, um, waiting for them to have seizures because they wanted to find out where it came from, where the, the epilepsy came from, and take that bit of the brain out. Um, but while he was there, we did some experiments on the tinnitus, and we contrasted the high and low tinnitus states. Um, all these orange circles are the brain activity that corresponds to the tinnitus. But what I'm showing you here in red... <coughs> He had a tiny, tiny malformed area of his brain here, that in, in red here. Um, it's very close to, this is the back end of one of the memory centers in the brain. And there's an orange circle there indicating that that bit of brain changed its activity when the tinnitus changed. And then this darker gray area around, this is the area the surgeons ended up removing from the brain. Now this, this man had tinnitus in both his ears. It had been there for a very long time. One, and you'll see that the area they took out just lopped off the back end of this memory center, not the whole thing, but a little bit of it that seemed relevant to tinnitus. And after that, now the, the, in, in many respects, one half of the brain controls the other half of the body or represents it or the other ear. So the opposite side to which he was operated on, the tinnitus went from that ear and it never came back. Now, I'm not suggesting it, you know, that people go and have brain surgery, um, but there was... It had been suggested, actually, that targeting that structure might be a way of sort of breaking this, breaking this memory of tinnitus get, and actually getting rid of it. And we've, we've talked to the person who put those theories out, who's very excited about all of this, that actually it does seem like, so we didn't, we didn't interrupt the hearing parts of the brain, just this tiny bit of that memory center implicated in tinnitus, and the, and the tinnitus went from the, from the other ear. Now, unfortunately, he did have a few, not, not dramatic, but he had a few cognitive problems. It, you know, it, it wasn't without side effects. So this is not a widely effective treatment, but it does just make us wonder, is there a more rational, targeting, safer, more low-key approach to breaking this cycle, as has been done in a still rather a blunderbuss, lobotomy-esque fashion here? So it's, it's food for thought.